Hello everyone, I recently saw a tweet from Ohio's representative Jim Jordan and I wanted to talk about a couple instances of virulently anti-science and anti-intellectual sentiments that exist in American politics. So let's jump right in. <laughs> Jim Jordan, a Republican representative of Ohio, tweeted on January 27, 2023, quote, Maybe we wouldn't have a debt crisis if the government wasn't funding plankton and salmon studies, close quote. There is a lot to unpack here. First, the spicy political stuff. Let's look at the stats of the U.S. federal budget of 2022 in detail. During that fiscal year, the federal government spent $6.27 trillion U.S. dollars in total. In order, the top 10 categories of spending are Social Security, Health, Income Security, National Defense, Medicare, Education, Net Interest, Veterans Benefits and Services, Transportation, General Government Spending, and then about 1% for everything else, which encompasses just $65 billion. In contrast, Social Security alone was $1.22 trillion and National Defense was $767 billion. Of that remaining $65 billion, just $8.8 .8 billion went to the National Science Foundation, which sponsors scientific research projects, fellowships, and the construction and operation of major scientific facilities. $8.8 .8 billion of $6.27 trillion is just a bit over 0.1%, or one thousandth of the total federal budget. The National Science Foundation reports that their annual budget for 2023 is $9.5 billion, which they say is the source for about 25% of, quote, all federally supported basic research conducted by America's colleges and universities, close quote. They don't explicitly say that the entire budget is used this way, but even if we assume that it is, the total federal support for research at college and universities would be around $38 billion, which is about 0.6% of the total federal budget. Furthermore, the American Institute of Physics provides an online tracker on the federal budget for several years that gives the federal funding towards many institutions of science in greater detail. If we add all of this up for the total federal budget spending on science in 2022, it is about $200 billion, or 3.2% of the total federal budget. And if we exclude the defense and security-related science funding, it's $80 billion, or 1.3%. Imagine someone spent $10,000, of which $100 or $300 was given to you, and then they claimed you specifically put them in debt. That's very ridiculous, isn't it? Bear in mind, this is for all federally funded science. The research into plankton, which probably falls mostly under NOAA, would take just a fraction of NOAA's $0.6 billion budget, which is 0.01% of the total federal budget. The idea that we wouldn't have a debt crisis if we didn't support plankton studies with federal funding is not just silly, it's pathologically ignorant. Well, first of all, let's clarify what's, what the NASA budget is. Do you realize that the... 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 $850 billion, uh, uh, what was it, with the banks? TARP. TARP. Yes. Bailout. The bailout. The bank bailout. That sum of money could reach Venus. <laughs> <laughs> that sum of money is greater than the entire 50-year running budget of NASA. Wow. And so when someone says, we don't have enough money for this space probe, I'm asking, no, it's not that you don't have enough money. It's that the distribution of money that you're spending is warped. It makes way more sense to blame wasteful spending on the military-industrial complex like the F-35 fighter jet for which the federal government poured in 1.7 trillion U.S. dollars, but neither the GOP nor, let's be fair here, the DNC are really big fans of cutting military spending. 
Besides, as much as they like to paint themselves as the party of fiscal responsibility, it's the GOP which drove up the deficit in the last decades, starting with Ronald Reagan's trickle-down economics. In recent years under the Trump presidency, the national debt increased by $3.3 trillion even prior to the start of the pandemic. This largely happened as a result of tax cuts that mainly benefited the rich, which reduced federal revenue while spending increased. One might call this hypocrisy, but that's the point of it. By and large, Republicans don't really care about deficits and debt, and some are quite open about that. Take Mick Mulvaney, former director of the Office of Management and Budget, who admitted that, quote, My party is very interested in deficits when there is a Democrat in the White House. The worst thing in the whole world is deficits when Barack Obama was the president. Then Donald Trump became president, and we're a lot less interested as a party, close quote. Thus, complaints about deficits and debt are very often not made out of good faith. It's a partisan bludgeon used against certain programs that a given politician happens to dislike. Republicans are just being consistent with themselves when they advocate for cutting federal programs, even those that are beneficial to the average citizen or the poor, while decreasing federal revenue through tax cuts for the rich and corporations. Oh gee, I do wonder what really motivates them. Now with that out of the way, let's move on to why such studies actually make studying plankton not just interesting to the nerdy scientists, but vitally important. First, what is plankton anyway? Technically, plankton just means any organism that cannot swim against a current. So everything from viruses to bacteria to protists to jellyfish to small shrimp to fish larvae constitute plankton. We can then divide plankton into a variety of categories based on size, from the extremely tiny viruses on one end to jellyfish longer than a person on the other. Or we can divide plankton into categories based on what they do. Phytoplankton, like foraminifera and diatoms, photosynthesize, while zooplankton catch their food. Now this may be extremely remedial for my audience, but this is apparently new information to some, like Representative Jordan. Plankton form the basis of many ecosystems in both freshwater and saltwater. In ecology, there is this concept called the food chain, or more accurately, a food web, and at the base of the food chain is an organism that makes its own food through photosynthesis, like phytoplankton. This type of organism is called a primary producer. Primary producers are then eaten by primary consumers, which may be small shrimp or fish, and then primary consumers are eaten by secondary consumers, which may be larger fish. The secondary consumer might even be eaten by another animal, and so on. So now let's take an example of this process. Humans often eat tuna. Tuna consume a variety of fish, and let's just pick one, herring. Herring eat zooplankton, such as arrowworms, copepods, amphipods, and krill, among other animals. Those worms and shrimp then eat diatoms and other phytoplankton. Thus, without plankton, pretty much the rest of the ecosystem wouldn't exist. It therefore makes some degree of sense to study plankton as they evidently form an integral part of the environment. But not only does it make sense to study what plankton are and how they fit into the ecosystem, but it also makes sense to study them to understand uh, if any of our human activities are affecting them. So for instance, scientists recently found that as our oceans are becoming more acidic, this is causing planktonic foraminifera to have progressively thinner shells. In fact, within the last 140 years, foraminifera shells have become 76% thinner. Why are the oceans becoming more acidic? Because the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is increasing, which causes the oceans to absorb more carbon dioxide in the form of carbonic acid. Why is the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere increasing? Because humans are pumping out massive amounts of carbon dioxide through the burning of fossil fuels in factories and vehicles. So even though humans are not directly impacting plankton, we are doing it indirectly, and harming plankton will in turn harm aquatic ecosystems, which many humans also rely on for their livelihoods and or their sustenance. These aren't alarmist hypotheticals, but are already happening in some places. For example, in the Northeast Atlantic Ocean, fish populations have been decreasing for the last 25 years, owing in large part to the reduction in zooplankton. As the oceans are warming, this causes ocean stratification to be strengthened, which decreases nutrient exchange among the layers. Since nutrients are harder to come by for phytoplankton, species that require higher concentrations of nutrients to survive will die off 
and be replaced by species that need lower concentrations. Diatoms are one of the main food sources for copepods, but diatoms need substantial concentrations of nutrients. By contrast, cyanobacteria need much fewer nutrients, however, copepods can't eat cyanobacteria. With less food for the copepods, that means fewer copepods, which means there will be fewer fish. It then comes as no surprise that copepod populations in the Northeast Atlantic have experienced a 50% reduction in the last 60 years. Even the politicians should care since the health of these ecosystems underpin a huge portion of our economy. The rather modest federal funding that goes into the research of plankton or ecology in general then makes perfect sense from a non-myopic perspective since we would pay a far greater cost if we neglected the well-being of our natural resources. So yes, studying plankton is important. And in case you think Jim Jordan's war on plankton research is the only item on his list of targets, two days after his plankton tweet, he extolled, quote, more school choice, less government, close quote, and linked to a Federalist Society opinion piece by Kerry Ingram praising conservative Republican governors and legislators furthering that end. And who should Ingram turn out to be? None other than another recent fellow of the Discovery Institute, the conservative Seattle think tank banging the drum of intelligent design. Ideas do indeed have consequences, and ones grounded on bad methods, including hasty attacks on legitimate and necessary science research, give us elected representatives like Jim Jordan. Bear that in mind next time you vote. I want to point out before concluding that Jim Jordan is by no means a lone wolf when it comes to hatred of science, or politicians trying to score points among those even more scientifically illiterate than they are. Decades ago, Senator William Proxmire, a Democrat, was infamous for his Golden Fleece Awards, assailing science research whose context he didn't always understand. But in recent times, the tendency to attack science research has gone highly partisan, associated with the Republican Party. Former Governor of Alaska Sarah Palin said on October 24th, 2008, quote, You've heard about some of these pet projects. They really don't make a whole lot of sense, and sometimes these dollars go to projects that have little or nothing to do with the public good. Things like fruit fly research in Paris, France. I kid you not. Close quote. In this particular instance, the olive fruit fly was being studied because it was a major pest of California's olive trees, which was a huge economic problem for California. Fortunately, the grants eventually led to a breakthrough in the fly's management, but fruit flies are important to science for another reason. The field of genetics, as we know it, exists because of fruit flies. The concepts of genes, mutations, recombination, and linkage maps, among others, are owed to fruit fly scientists like Thomas Hunt Morgan and his colleagues. Medical genetic testing exists because of fruit fly research. As entomologist Frank Zalom said back in 2008, quote, This kind of stuff always drives me nuts. It's a total lack of understanding of the importance of research. Close quote. And in our video, Is the Earth Warming?, we pointed to the time former Oklahoma Senator Jim Inhofe thought finding snow debunked global warming. There are numerous instances of politicians making comments like this, and they tend to come predominantly from one side of the political aisle. One that claims to be highly concerned with the economy, even though publicly funded science has an extremely high return of investment since this has led to groundbreaking innovations such as the internet, GPS, and even Google, just to name a few. As cell biologist Vivian Siegel said, quote, it is up to each of us to help all the Sarah Palins of this world and all the Joe the taxpayers behind them understand and appreciate the value of all kinds of research, both within and beyond our borders, close quote. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you all next time.